Hello and welcome to CB Online. These episodes are designed to help you love God and love others. So let's worship. scream it out from every mountain top your goodness knows no bounds your goodness never stops your mercy follows me your kindness fills my life your love amazes me and i'll sing because you are good and i dance because you are good and i shout because you are good you are good to me to me and i sing because you are good and i dance because you are good and i shout because you are good you are good good to me Never 
stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. It amazes me. It amazes me. Amen. We love to worship Jesus through music. We're just going to spend a bit of our time now wrestling with the Bible and some of the big questions of the day, our series on 2 Corinthians. You are going to love this, so check this out. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10.5, The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. In the letter of 2 Corinthians, we've seen Paul fighting for the church in Corinth to be the church. And one of the things he's fighting against is what he refers to in different ways, the spirit of the age, the wisdom of the world, these thoughts and pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. And whilst the wisdom of the world, the spirit of the age in our day is different, to first century Corinth, there, are, there is a spirit of the age, there is wisdom of the world, there are thoughts and pretensions that continue to set themselves up against the knowledge of God in our day. And so we wanted to spend a bit of time in this session trying to fight that fight that Paul was fighting against the thoughts that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. And a big one for us, which we've referenced a few times on Sundays recently, is this philosophy really of expressive individualism. Uh, to put it in popular terms, you do you, hun. You do you, hun. Uh, it's kind of this idea that somewhere in us, there's this authentic self that has been repressed maybe by ourselves or by our society. And our job as humans is really to uncover that and to express what's really in, in us and to live our most authentic selves um, or, or, or what we find, you know, whether it's M people search for the hero inside yourself, uh, whether it's NWA express yourself, a myriad of different popular movies, novels, storylines, advice. This is the message of our culture. Uh, one book that we've been drawing on quite a bit is this book here, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. And it's quite a high level history of philosophy, history of thought, how we've got to this point in Western culture where this is the sea that we swim in, the narrative that we live. Tom, you've referenced a couple of times on the Sundays um, some things that, that Truman talks about, uh, the effect of Darwin, removing the telos from the universe, the, the commentary of Nietzsche, uh, if God is dead, where does that leave us? Uh, can you try a little bit more about some of the big pieces that have led us to this culture, this expressive individualism, and how you see it playing out a little bit? Yeah, um, I think the thing that I found most interesting about the book, 
and about looking at society is that, that it feels like um, there's a real sort of nihilism that sits behind so much. And ultimately, um, you know, Nietzsche, he birthed his thinking out of disappointment, out of like, the world isn't what it should be. And it was like a rejection of a Christian perspective that drove him. And I think um, Darwin equally looked at, it was, it was a sense of loss and pain that led him. He looked at a particular wasp and he couldn't understand what a purpose this wasp could possibly have. Why would God have created a wasp that just seemed to uh, kill things, destroy mm. stuff? Um, and it was really a, a struggling with evil that created so much of this thinking and caused him to reject um, quite a plastic view of God, that God's this happy, smiley creator. Um, and, and I guess where I come at it and looking at what Paul brings from 2 Corinthians and uh, the perspective that he brings, which would bear true in my life, would be that uh, he has quite a complex understanding of the, why the world is like it is now. And um, in this verse that we looked at, he says, you know, he, he, look, he believes that there's strongholds, uh, divine power to come against the strongholds and pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. And, and he's talking about a very, like, there's a spiritual aspect to life, there's a physical aspect to life, there's an emotional aspect to life, there's a mental aspect to life. And the rich tapestry of the biblical explanation of life is so much deeper and greater than just God's a good God who's full of love who wants to bring happiness to the world. And it was really, as far as I can see, the rejection of that concept of a God that led the likes of the Romantics, Pierce, um, she uh, Shelley, um, the, the big sort of um, movement of the, Ref um, of the Reformation, uh, led into so much thinking from the Enlightenment about we need to reject this idea that there's a this happy, clappy God who just wants to make everything wonderful. Mm. Um, but what they're rejecting was never the Christian belief. Yeah. It was never the vision of the Bible of God and never really the Christian vision of humanity. Um, and so it landed at a place that just feels like it, I don't know, maybe maybe expressive individualism has some things going for it, but it's just such a narrow and actually ultimately claustrophobic view of what it is to be human beings. It's only as large as I can imagine it to be. Mm. How do you see that playing out, like street level people's lives today? I think what I see playing out is that as somebody who has been given the gospel that Jesus acted on our behalf, he came in to do things for us we could never do for ourselves. It, it's almost like you're fighting so hard to convince people that there is a power outside of you who's here to help you. It's not, it's not clean cut, it's not like happy clappy, it's not like whatever you wish, whatever you pray for instantly happens. No, the Bible never promises that. But the playing out that I see is really a hopelessness yeah. that has hit the vast majority of the Western world. May I say, you meet people who come to the UK from Africa, and there's a joy and a hopefulness that's because th these guys have not bought into the expressive individualism. Yeah. But the vast, it's, it's actually a quite an arrogant Western perspective to say, you do you, hun, is, is reality. Like, that's not what the vast majority of cultures in the world really believe or think or would buy into. And we've got to be really careful if we start to say this is, this is what everybody thinks because it really isn't. Yeah, it's the narrow and, and thing, the, isn't the it? embodied joy and hope of many people from what we might call the developing world is just utterly convicting of the ultimately the barrenness that expressive individual and expressive individualism brings as opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ that they live and they've lived through many of these wonderful women and men in our church the most utterly awful circumstances yeah. and yet 
hope just bounces from every fibre of their being. And that's how I see it playing out. Yeah, it's amazing. I think that when you're talking about hopelessness, I quite often see the response to that in escapism, essentially. People pl- kind of playing the card of, I've been living a lie and therefore I can renege on every commitment I've ever made. And it, it is a hopeless response, isn't it? Which, which leads to escapism. Lara, um, give us a bit of wisdom from, from a, a younger generation to these old men. How do you see the kind of you do you thing playing out amongst your contemporaries and, mm. and younger? So even for people my age, I've seen it, and even seen it in my own life, this idea of like not being able to see yourselves doing one thing for the rest of your life because that doesn't seem like it expresses or encompasses all of who we are and all of what our identity is. And so there's all of these other things within us that we want to express or explore or do, do you and start this side hustle or start this Instagram page or start this business. And then with all of that, it's quite overwhelming to think that all of these represent a part of who you are. But how do I juggle it? How do I maintain it all on, a, all on, on your own? And so there's this, this pressure that's been added to try and be all of these different versions of you and I guess for young people when they look at picking universities or colleges then there's that whole pressure like whatever I pick is going to determine exactly who I am because this is how everyone else lives Uh, and there's 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 a panic and a pressure um, of wanting to feel like you know exactly who you are or you know exactly what you're supposed to do because that's that's how everyone else kind of seems to live. Does that make sense? It really does. It sounds yeah. exhausting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this, but this kind of expectation of I should have this somewhere within me, mm-hmm. and therefore express it, and a kind of pick and mix, mm-hmm. low commitment, grab something, hope that it finds meaning, mm-hmm. low commitment levels. Is, is that playing out? Is that mm-hmm. fair? Or am I being a, a grumpy old man? No, I, I get that, and it's all <laughs> part of finding yourself. Okay, and I think. It's not all necessarily a bad thing, and there's like definitely not, and there's there's part of exploring how you've been created, but it it depends on whether that is you doing you without God or you doing you with God, and, and yeah. where what level of authority you're putting on yourself to make all of these things work for you. Yeah. So uh, how do we speak into this? If you see the problem, mm-hmm. like what, what does the gospel bring? What does Jesus bring? Mm-hmm. What, what message are you trying to get across to your contemporaries and younger? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the best way that I can think of it is that God is our creator and our designer. And we, the Bible talks about how we are like jars of clay and God is the potter, we are the clay. And so if we're trying to do you and trying to figure out all of these things on our own, then we can only mould ourselves to the best of our understanding of the world and of our design when we're not our designers, and God is. So through surrendering to God and looking at what Jesus did and spending time with God and being in his presence um, and listening to the truth of our identity in the word, then we can be moulded into, into the best and most authentic version of our identity that God has created us for. So if we're trying to make ourselves into a bowl when God has designed us as a vase, then we're never going to fully feel like we are living in purpose, regardless of what we're doing. So the most important thing is to follow Jesus, to look to him and be transformed by him as our guide. And I think that's how you do you <laughs> in, in, yeah. in, a, in a way that is true to who God has created us to be. Authority and surrender. Yeah. Quite alien concepts, aren't they, they for are. our culture? <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I think a, a burden I've got at the moment, it's so interesting, Tom, to hear you speak about people from outside the West and what they bring. So I just feel like I want to make people doubt a little bit this expressive individualistic narrative. Like, why would that be true? And where does it lead long term? And pull that out for me a little bit more. Like, where do you think this is going? And does it fit the reality that, that we find ourselves in and that we've been given. So I just find myself saying, really? <laughs> a little bit more like, really? Just tell me more. Mm. And often as, as people tell me more, they begin to unravel because it doesn't fit the reality that we actually find ourselves in. Um, referenced in the teaching on Sunday, which you can see we'll link it up, but you know, the big, big problems with the you do you philosophy 
Um, and it's funny because it, it's, it's got that characteristics of false teaching in that individualism has come out of Christian culture, isn't it? I mean, another book that we've referenced before is Dominion by Tom Holland. Like, almost all of our thought is Christian in the West to some degree. And individualism, like, you have dignity, value and worth as an individual. That is a Christian doctrine. Like, from places outside of Christendom, that doesn't bubble up naturally. And yet it's been, been twisted to where suddenly we now have to be our own authority, surrender to this thing inside of us when actually it's come out and it, it, I want people to doubt it. I want people to doubt it, which is maybe slightly negative, but it's where, where I've got to. But Tom, why don't, why don't you give us a bit of, you've been fighting really with, with this two Corinthian message and this mm. be the church and it's coming against this stronghold of thought in many ways, isn't it? And what, what are the big truths that you are wanting to proclaim and see people find and flourish in? Yeah, I think the two, two that I would really land on, I think the first one is that there is a God. <laughs> I, I don't know that sounds crazy, but I, I, I grew up, you know, I was from a highly, like, a family who highly valued education. Yeah. I did Latin GCSE age 12, like we, we did everything we could to get as many qualifications as, you know, we loved education, our brain is our ticket to the future, yeah. and you know, straight A's throughout Cambridge University, studying theology, fascinated by philosophy. And yet in the break, like I'd go to lectures and we could dissect sections of the Bible, we could learn Latin, I'd learn, you know, learn modern Greek, you can learn all this stuff and the sections of yourself are just not switched on by that. And you realise there's more to humanity than just my brain. And then I'd come across people who'd live purely like what would Philip Reef would call the therapeutic self. Everything's how do I feel about this? How do I feel about this? How do I feel about this? And like, there's more to you than just your emotions. Mm. Like, there's a complexity in humanity that ultimately finds, for me, found deep satisfaction. One day, I walked into a room and had an encounter with something beyond myself. And I was like, this now makes sense of the world and Paul's message to the guys in Corinth is like look there's there's like a light that shone into your hearts it's God God is real can you not see and he talks about this power that's on display he talks about the light that's coming to your life and sometimes I just feel like I just wish that I could just touch someone on the shoulder and, and be like God is real and that changes everything if you really believe if you really understand it. it flips all we don't start with thinking from I think this I'm an authority God is real mm -hmm. and if you think that through and like follow the that web you you end up putting up and you see in front of you Jesus Christ like the image of the glory of God and you're like wow this changes everything that would be number one and the number two thing would be like what is success because the thing about expressive individualism is it removes any ability to judge. That sounds wonderful, because I don't want you to judge me, but I actually want you to tell me I'm okay. I want you to, to do the assessment of me that says, you are worth it. I'm glad you're alive. Mm. And I want to say to myself, have I done all right? Have I done all right? And the removal of any form of judgment actually is so crippling. I don't want the negative judgment. I don't want judgmentalism. But I do want people to say, oh, I'm glad you're here. Mm. I'm glad you were born. Like, what you did just now really made a difference to my life. I want meaning. I want purpose. And so that, that's, again, what Paul talks about. So alien. But he says, in the, in the presence of God, commissioned by God, I preach Christ. And there will be a day when I will stand before Jesus and I will receive the reward due to me for what I've done in the body. So he constructs and sort of affirms what he as a Jewish person knew that 
this God who exists also is the one who will make a call on what you've done with your life. And this God who is going to make a call on what you've done with your life is full of grace and he's offering you right now the opportunity to hear him declare of you, well done, well done, you've done great. And that to me is like, what an incredible offer. Yeah. I don't have to judge myself. I don't have to be judged by you. The God who made everything full of grace can speak over me, well done, you've done great. You've got meaning, you've got purpose. I'm glad I created you. Forever now you can live out of that. And I think there's, there's no message that I've seen in any philosophy, any book written that comes close to being as attractive and delightful as that message. It's the gospel. It's the, the gospel, gospel of yeah. Jesus. I think the appropriate response to that is to pray. Lara, would you pray to finish for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. God, we thank you so much that we don't have to live life alone, that you created us um, to be in relationship with you. And I thank you so much for your authority. And although that seems like a taboo word when we think of the world, Lord, you are a gracious, a kind, and a loving God who, whose authority is for our good. Like your plans are not to harm us, they are to, to prosper us, to grow us. And so Lord, I just pray that um, where we may be resistant or where we may have conformed to the world and we, we need to, we want to surrender and figure out what it is that you're doing in our lives and who you've created us to be, Lord. I just pray that we would be able to do that with open hands, with open hearts and accept your truth and your freedom for our lives. In Jesus' name. So there we go. We've been really enjoyed looking at 2 Corinthians with you today. If you've got any questions or comments or anything else at all, please just pop it on the comment section of whatever platform you're viewing this on or email us at hello at croinvineyard.org.uk. We would love to hear from you. So we hope to catch you next week for another CV Online. In the meantime, be blessed. Hey now. We're only at the start of what he's doing here. Hey now, you don't have to lose. people 1995 you've got to search for the <laughs> there we go we're getting into it now aren't we we're getting into it now hey now we're only at the start of what he's doing here Go of every disappointment. Let us cling to love, to the hope ahead of us, so we can hold on to every single Hold on.